Well, welcome everyone online and all our COG family and everyone here. Um, we are getting ready for our all night prayer service. Praise God, get to pray and spend time with the Lord. It's always good. And so we have uh, Natasha here from our COG uh, Houston prayer group. So it's good to have people coming in and we're going to be seeing a lot more people coming in over the times and God's good. Um, so uh, just a few announcements. You notice we're in a different place. Um, it's a little bit dark online, so just bear with us um, as we are uh, we're downstairs now into our bookstore. Um, and so we'll be down here from uh, pretty much from now on unless things start to change and um, we outgrow this room, which is a big probability. So we're just going to flow as we go. And as we grow, we'll just uh, move to the next place. But for now, we got we have this place. Uh, really, it's been a blessing is uh, we have it now as much as we need it. So that's good. And uh, so while we're in the transition of uh, setting up all the lighting and making sure everything's good, let me back up a little bit here, uh, making sure everything's good. And you can see us just bear with us for a little while um, because we're going to be making sure there's more light and everything. So it's a little it's a little darker. I'm going to see about getting some LEDs or something. Um, so just so it's a lot brighter. Uh, and so when I was drawing the board, you can actually read it. So we'll see how it goes today. Um, it's going to be fun and good adventure. And then uh, uh, and so that's that's how we're going. So um, we're also going to be down here now from now on. So uh, our next uh, service is going to be Sunday at three. So you're welcome to uh, to join us um, there and watch our live stream online. And so uh, before we start, I'm going to have a, just a, a little song. Um, and I'm just going to sing. I know it's the same sometimes, but, you know, uh, that's what God puts on my heart. That's what I know. You know? <laughs> um, and so uh, just uh, we're going to go ahead and sing a song. And, and then um, from there, we'll go into the, the all night prayer service. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about the prayer of faith. And so that's exciting. I like talking about the prayer of faith. And uh, so we're going to have uh, bring some some hopefully I'll bring some new things to the board uh, for you. So. All right. Well, Father, we're just going to come to you tonight. I just thank you so much for your presence. Thank you so much for your glory and your love. And Father, I thank you that you are so good. Thank you for Jesus and his precious blood. The washes as white as snow as we come and we repent before you. and just ask you to cover us with that blood and wash us clean. So it is no more, God. And so I just ask you tonight, God, that you would touch everyone here, everyone online, that they would not be the same. They wouldn't leave the same they came. Father, that your glory would come and touch them, your presence, God, that they would know that you are here in this place. I thank you so much for your presence and for answering our prayer and being with us here tonight. Father, prepare us, open up our eyes that we may see and our ears that may be here. Give us a heart to understand. And Father, I'm just asking as we are preparing tonight, we're hearing your good word, that you help us to enter into new levels of prayer and, and intercession and the prayer of faith and all these different prayers that need to be prayed, that you help us enter in this time of seeking your face and to know you, Father. We just thank you and praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. So if you want to sing with us, we're going to lift up our hearts and worship to the Lord. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow oh, no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus lord god we just thank you so much for the precious blood of jesus we just thank you god come in this place again in jesus name we pray amen well we're going to be uh, talking tonight about the prayer of faith. 
Now, uh, I want to share. I'm going to be sharing some keys, but we're going to go over it. But last time we prayed that or talked about the prayer dedication. Now, before we start, the reason why I started with the prayer dedication is before you can pray the prayer of faith, you need to pray the prayer of dedication. And uh, we're going to go through a few scriptures and why that's the case. Why is it we need to be in a place of dedication and consecration to God, our Father? And so we're going to look at the life of the Master, Jesus. So let's turn to Luke I'm going to turn to Luke uh, 23, I'm sorry, Luke 22, and we're going to look specifically um, at verse 42. So give some time to look there, already pre-turned, so if you're with us tonight, turn with us to Luke 22, verse 42. Um, We're going to do a little bit of a review, because before we can actually get into this prayer of faith, Um, We need to understand why it is we need to pray the prayer of dedication. Because a lot of times when you come into, you know, in in my experience with church, my experience growing up, it's like, you need to pray the prayer of faith. I'm like, all right, let's get out there. Let's pray the prayer of faith. And then I go out there and I thought I was praying every the prayer of faith. And I would notice that things weren't working. It's having some troubles. And I was wanting to know, God, why, why is it not working? And uh, then I would see people get shipwrecked in their faith as they're praying and as they're seeking God and trying to exercise faith. I myself have been shipwrecked before. So if you've been in that place where you've been shipwrecked and maybe you got a little bitter, the bitter waters, because you're like, Lord, I, I stepped out in faith, everything I was taught, and yet I didn't experience what I was believing for, what I was expecting, what I was told I could receive. And so... Um, <laughs> just one sec. Um, and so where we are in this place of, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to move in the power of God and let God use me in praying this prayer of faith. We got to start somewhere. Sometimes I didn't know that there is a prayer of consecration and prayer dedication that needs to proceed. All right, we're moving the lights around. That that works out a little better. Okay, so sometimes we need to start out somewhere, but if we don't know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. But if you've been in that place where you had experienced a loss and you're like, I tried that faith thing, maybe it's time you let's look at some of these things. And so we're going to start here. Verse 42 of Luke uh, chapter 22, and it says, saying, this is Jesus. Actually, I'm going to start with verse 41. It says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The reason why we got to start with the prayer of consecration, the prayer of dedication, before we can pray the prayer of faith is we got to understand that there is a will of God involved in our lives. We got to know the will of God. One thing I love about Jesus says, if it's your will, we're going to talk about this if, because last time we talked about the if prayer, if it be your will. And I had shared about, well, if you don't know God's will on the matter and you don't have scripture to stand on what, what God has said on it, Well, that's where we pray the prayer of dedication. We're going to pray the if prayer, the if it be your will. Now, there's a part of this prayer of dedication that comes into this prayer of faith, and that is submission to God. So we can't do anything of ourselves. When you understand there's nothing coming from you uh, when it's coming to the power of God, it's his power. That's his. It doesn't belong to us, but it comes through us. God will use us in those things. So we need to understand what's our part, what's God's part. A lot of times we get those things mixed up. Think, oh, well, I'm just going to believe. I'm just going to go out there and do this thing because I, you know, faith. Well, let's talk about really what faith is and how it comes. And we'll, we'll look at some of those things. But I wanted to start out with this scripture, not my will, but yours be done. 
not my will, but yours be done. And we're going to look at a few things before we transition over to the prayer of faith, because we're going to look at this prayer consecration before. We have to have this work in beforehand before we can really um, move into this prayer of faith effectively. I want us to turn to John 5, 19. John 5, 19. John 5, 19, it says that Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. What's interesting about this, he says, I, don't, I can't do nothing of myself, but I only do what I see the father do. Only what I see the Father do. And so there's this, there's this relationship that Jesus had with the Father. I'm not going to do anything unless you show me, Father. I'm not going to do it. And so he knew what he was called to do. In verse 20, you see, and he shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So we got to understand that there is a... Um, a will that God wants to be done, and there's it's being shown to him by the Father. We're going to skip down to verse 30, and it says, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. See, in everything, we got to seek the will of the Father. Even with the prayer of faith, where we know what God wants to do because there's Scripture, what precedes that is submission to the will of God. Um, and I'll just bring this up before we, uh, we, we uh, are talking about this prayer of faith. Um, if someone is sick, but it's their time to go home, is praying the prayer of faith correct? The answer is no. See, there is a time appointed for a man to die. Right? There's a time. If it's someone's time and yet you go there and say, hey, listen, I'm going to pray the prayer of faith for you going to live. But the Lord's like, well, wait a minute. It's time for them to come home. They've lived a long life. They're healthy. But it's their time to go. You don't pray the prayer of faith. And that's where you submit your will to the will of the father. You pick up that cross and you die. So there's a place of complete submission to God in all things, even with the prayer of faith, because even though we have given the ability to do things, Jesus had ability. But he didn't do everything just because he had ability. He was only doing what the Lord showed him to do. It's interesting when the Syrophoenician lady came to him, he said, uh, healing is the children's bread. I wasn't sent to you. I was sent to the house of Israel. There was a timing of Jesus. It was interesting by faith, she was able to tap into something that wasn't for her yet. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we got to know what God's will is on the matter. We got to understand what he wants to do in this time and this hour in our lives. Um, and there's a lot of things that go into God's will. You might be wondering what you're called to do. If you don't know what you're called to do and where you're called to be, how can you walk in faith? You don't know. That's why the prayer dedication is so important. You get neutral. You find out what God wants to do, not just in the matter, but with your life. What are you called to do? What has he given you? And so that's what's a wonderful journey about this prayer dedication, because we lay everything down and he begins to show us what he wants to do. He begins. To, and as we go through the written word and we find scriptures, we get to find out. What belongs to us as believers, as sons and daughters of God? The other thing that uh, before you can pray the prayer of faith. And uh, I've heard the prayer dedication has to precede this, but there's something else that we need to in order to pray this prayer of faith. Let's turn to Galatians five or six. 
And if you're familiar with this, I turn to it quite often. Um, Galatians 5, verse 6. Um, Galatians 5, 6. It says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. How does faith work? It works through love. That that word working is a Greek word called energes, where we get the word energy from. Faith is energized by love. So there's a place where we got to have this consecration to the will of God before we can pray the prayer of faith. And there's a place to where um, consecrated and dedicated our lives. And there's a place where we have to have the working of love. Not just any kind of love, not that kind of love that you hear like, man, I love you. And then they're like, oh, I love pizza and I love this. And I love them like, whoa, what kind of love is? No, it's God's kind of love. So before we can get into this prayer of faith, we need to have a consecrated life. Knowing God's will and submitted to it. And then next we need to have the love of God working and operating our life. And what's interesting about the two is they correspond to one another. A man and woman of God who submits to God's will loves God. When you submit to the will of God, that means you're going to submit to his word. You're going to submit to everything he's given to you. And so Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments and I will love you and I'll come and manifest myself to you. And that's John 14 uh, verse 21 that I'm referencing there. So these two things will correspond so when you are coming to pray the prayer of faith, what's getting dedication to God and the love of God? Those two things need to get in order before we can move there. Now, I'm preaching from this place to where we're going to have those two in order, we're going to be consecrated and dedicated to God, and we're going to have God's love working in our life. Now, there's a process of growth. And everything, there's a process of growth. And we're going to talk about some of these processes as we're going through. But before we do that, I'm going to turn to another scripture. It's in 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. And we had, uh, I've been preaching about this uh, genuine faith. If you're familiar with that. This genuine kind of faith uh, last Sunday. So 2 Timothy chapter 1. Five through seven. Second Timothy. Um, and we talked about genuine faith, and now we're going to talk about something else. So uh, it's uh, and also if anyone competes, I'm sorry, wrong one, wrong scripture. Uh, five through seven. Here we go. Oh yeah, here we are. It says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I persuade is also in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. I want you to remember this, stirring up the gift of God in you through the laying on of hands. All right. Laying on of hands is important. We're going to look at that too. And it says in verse seven, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. These are important to document down as we're going through. But a power that's actually translated dunamis. He's given us a spirit of dunamis and of love and of a sound mind. So he's given us three spirits here. Because it says he hasn't given us a spirit of fear but of. So we find power, love, and of a sound mind. All right. When I talked about love. Love is interesting because it says in 1 John that perfect love casts out all fear. So when you've got perfect love, well, you don't have the spirit of fear. God's not given us that. So that love takes care of that fear. But then you also have uh, the power of God and you have a sound mind. And we're going to look into more about this sound mind. But let me tell you, if you have the love of God, Perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. See, the love of God will take care of torment and it brings a sound mind. 
But we're going to look at these because there's other things that go with this. Um, and then you have the dunamis power of God. We, we have seen in many of the studies that we've done this dunamis power, like the lady with the issue of blood touched Jesus by faith. That's how we touched him today is by faith. She touched him by faith and the dunamis power of God flowed into her and she was healed. All right. So we see that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love and a sound mind. And we see that this is coming from a place to where there's a genuine faith. Genuine. I'm going to get into these different things as we begin to unpack it. So we got to know before we start to get in here, we have the prayer consecration that needs to happen or dedication. Then we need to have love working. And then we need to be in this place of genuine faith so that we have power, love, and a sound mind at work. All right. Now let's get into this prayer of faith. Now over the years, I've learned a little bit here and a little bit there, line upon line, precept upon precept. And it's amazing how what God will do is he'll begin to teach you on one area because I remember asking God, what's wrong with me? seems like every time I'm trying to pray for faith, it's not working. Things aren't working, Lord. And he's like, hey, come here. Let's learn about love. And I was like, but Father, um, I want to learn about faith. He said, yeah, son, come on. Let's learn about love. So I was like, all right. Um, all right, God, I guess I'll just learn about love because that's what you want to teach me right now. So then I began to learn about love. And the Lord began to grow me in love because without love, your faith, how can it be energized? How can it be working? Because we found that faith works by love. Faith works by love. And so many times you help find when God wants to move, there's this overwhelming love that happens. You'll see it in the life of Jesus so many times. People needed to be fed. And it said he had compassion on the multitude. Compassion. There's this love that came out of Jesus and he ended up feeding and multiplying food. Then you see so many times people, the Lord moved with compassion and he healed people. The love of God just coming out, coming out. So I was like, all right, well, OK, I'm starting to understand why love is important. So then I began to learn about love before I began to learn about faith. So I had heard a lot about faith because I was interested in faith, I was interested in power, interested in the glory of God. I was interested in all what we call like the, the subjects that most Christians are interested in, like prosperity and blessing and all these great things. But when it came to love, well, that wasn't as popular. And even with me, I was like, uh, love. Yeah, I know you're supposed to love God, love your neighbor. God is love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that, God. But let's talk about these things. God always brought me back to love. Before you can move in real true prayer of faith, you need to have love at operation and love at work. And so there needs to be uh, that working. And so uh, excuse us, we're having some uh, sound stuff going on. So if you hear some sound in the background, just uh, don't pay attention to that. So anyways, um, we have... Uh, <clears throat> So many different things that God wants to bring tonight. Um, but the first point I want to make about praying the prayer of faith is this. Um, we want to make sure, this is where faith comes in. We want to make sure that what we're praying in our request is found in the written word of God, the scriptures. So important. A lot of times, uh, you know, you hear people talk about, uh, you know, I prayed in faith and this, all this stuff. And I'm like, well, what scripture do you have for that? What do you mean scripture? Well, I just had this. I just believed. I just believed. Well, what do you mean you believed? You have to have a scripture to pray the prayer of faith. If it's not written in the word of God, because um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, as we see in Romans 10, 17. If it's not in God's written word. You have to pray other prayers for that. It's not a guarantee. A guarantee is it's written in the word. That's how we can have faith because faith comes by that written word. 
And so anything not covered in the word of God needs to be received by other types of prayer. Can't You can't get it by this type, other types of prayer. And we had talked about in Ephesians how we pray all manner of prayer. There's all different types. And if we apply the wrong prayer to a situation, we can find ourselves in shipwreck. We can find ourselves in trouble. Well, I prayed, God, and it just didn't work. I prayed. I guess it must not. And this is the one I hear the most. I prayed about that, and it didn't happen, so I guess it wasn't God's will. Because what they're saying is, I prayed perfectly all manners of prayer, and I knew God's word on the matter, and it didn't work. That's not correct. See, just because you throw up a prayer like a hat, Maybe I can catch it up there and hope it works. Doesn't mean we pray correctly. Doesn't mean that's God's will on the matter. Because there's a lot of times when God has a will on the matter that because of people's free will and because of people not obeying him, things didn't happen according to God's will. It's, and one of the biggest ones I use is this. If everything that happens is God's will, And then God said that his will is that none should perish. All should come to eternal life. Do people perish and go to hell? Yes, they do. God's will did not happen in that matter. So not everything that happens is God's will. And just because you might have thrown up a prayer every once in a while doesn't mean that it not happening is not what God wanted to do. And so that's where... I just want to stop there because a lot of times, even in my own life, I was like, well, man, I guess, I guess might not have been God's will, but uh, that's not truth. We got to go with truth. We got to go with what God's word says, not based on our experience or lack thereof. Our experience does not mean that is the truth on the matter. Doesn't mean that's what not what God wanted to do either. So I just wanted to make sure that as we are learning to pray the prayer of faith, in faith, that we need to know what's involved. We need to make sure that everything that we're praying, when it comes to praying the prayer of faith, you have a promise, you have a scripture on it. There has to be in the word because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If it's not in God's word, there's no promise there, then that's when you pray the uh, different types of prayer, and depending on what the thing is, depends on the type of prayer. So we're gonna, so we're gonna go to the next uh, point that I like to cover here. There's a little exception to this, and a little exception to this is the spoken word of God, or what we call the Rhema word of God. See, there's a time we get a Rhema word of God that gives us faith. We get a special gift of faith. Because God said something on the matter. And we're going to turn to Matthew 14, uh, 28, 29 to look at this uh, as an example. And uh, I didn't go through and exhaust all the examples. I know we have a little bit more time today as far as like all night prayer. Um, But in John 14, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew 14, verse 28. We're going to see this is... uh, 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 this is basically when we see that Peter sees Jesus walking on the water. And uh, actually, I'm going to go back to verse 22, but we're going to concentrate on verse 28 and 29. It says in verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain himself to pray. Now, when evening ca- uh, came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. All right, verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's your command to me, uh, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So in this exception of the spoken word or the regular word of God, when it comes to this uh, moving in the in faith on, on a matter, we see that Peter asked Jesus. 
Peter made a request to walk on the water. Then in verse 29, we see Jesus' response. He said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. We see that Jesus spoke the rhema word to him, and he had faith given to him. This is not uh, a normal case where we see when it comes to pray the prayer of faith, where you get a rhema word from God. Um, This is more of the exceptional case in the matter. But um, what's interesting about this is this was not a promise to everybody. This was to Peter at that point in time. All right. And so if uh, any others had uh, gone out, he didn't give them permission or he didn't say come to them. They would have they would have drowned. A lot of times I've heard different people who um, are like, oh, well, I'm going to just believe God. And I'm going to do something like like Peter did. I'm just going to walk on the water. And uh, and so we're going to talk about this. Because I remember hearing a story about uh, there was a a meeting going on, and I think it was in Korea. And uh, the there was a flooding of a river. And all these people were trying to get across. um, But the river flooded and they couldn't get to the meeting. And so there was a group of these three girls And they said, hey, Peter walked in the water, so we'll just have faith and we're going to walk on the water and we're going to get across and we're going to go to this meeting. Well, they went to walk on the water and unfortunately and tragically, they got pulled in and they drowned. That is called presumption. And I want to talk about this presumption because we've got to cover it. We don't want shipwrecked faith. We don't want to be shipwrecked. or We don't want to be shipwrecked because we didn't have the faith that God said because we assumed We presume that, well, Peter walked on the water, so I'm going to walk on it now. Obviously, there's a need, but that's not how it works. This exception is, uh, as far as the spoken word of God, needs to be covered. You need to absolutely know that you've heard from God. You need to have faith with a good conscience, and we talked about faith with a good conscience. But these girls tragically died. They did not hear the word of God. They didn't have a promise because there's not a promise in the scripture of walking on water. Not directly like this. There's other times when uh, as the sons of God grow, we'll talk about that, but that's not a promise that we see where you get to walk on the water. All right. And so we're going to, we're going to look at this presumption um, because so many times when you begin to analyze a situation, all right, Lord, Let's look at this situation that I thought I was walking in faith in. Sometimes one of the biggest categories of people is they presumed they did not have a scripture. They thought, hey, I read where someone else did it, but God didn't promise that to them. It's wonderful about healing and walking in divine health is I can get promise after promise in the Bible about being healed and walking in divine health. And overcoming sickness and disease. But when it comes to this example in particular, you'll find that there's not a promise of it. But when Peter asked Jesus and Jesus spoke the word to him, he had faith for that situation at that time. But no one else got that on that boat, just Peter. All right, we're going to look. Let's turn to Hebrews 11.1. We're going to look at the definition of faith again. And uh, I'm not going to get too much in this definition right now, um, but we're going to go. We're going to read. We're going to read it. Um, Hebrews 11:1. 1, it says, uh, <clears throat> "Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by the, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony." And then. Um, Verse three, it says, by faith, we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. This is important for us to understand um, that the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. But uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And uh, sometimes people get a conviction and an assurance out of themselves because they believe that faith comes from them. And we're going to talk about that because sometimes I hear, well, have faith in God. And it's really translated how the faith of or from God. So you can, you can make that assumption. Well, I have faith in God. Well, I believe he'll do this for me. 
but he didn't specifically say in the scriptures that he would do that thing. So unless you're getting a rhema word of God, which is God speaking directly to you about the matter, you cannot walk in faith. You have to have a scripture written or written in the word for us to be able to walk in faith. Now I'm going to give this example and we're going to turn to Numbers uh, 1444 about this presumption. Um, I've been talking about that, this presumption. Numbers chapter 14, verse 44. Now just a little background about this. Um, We're not going to go back and read a whole bunch of it, but just a little background. The Lord told the children of Israel to go in to the promised land. So they sent out spies. Well, the spies went and looked at the land, and ten of them saw these giants and thought, oh, man, we are grasshoppers in their sight. And two of them said, hey, God's removed their protection from us. We're well able to take the land. And they came back, and they brought these testimonies to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel believed the ten ones that came and uh, spoke evil of the Lord. We can't take up this land. If we're not, well, we can't do it. And then Joshua and Caleb, the two that um, walked in faith, believe in God, said, no, we're well able to take the land. Well, they said, the children of Israel said, oh, we're going to die here in this wilderness. Boom, it was done. The Lord said, all right, you'll die here. You're not going to go into the promised land. Or you're going to be out here in 40 years. So he gives this, the Lord says, okay, you were supposed to go in, but because of your disobedience and because of your words, you're going to stay here and you're going to die. And your children are going to take the land. And so then all of a sudden they get this change of heart. Wait a minute. I don't really want to be in this desert. I want to go in now. See, the Lord said we're well able to take it. But now we have seen God spoke on the matter. Now, it says in verse 44, um, well, actually, we're gonna, uh, verse 43, it says, For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Verse 44, But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord no more, uh, nor Moses departed from the camp. It says, Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. See, God told them to do something. They disobeyed God. They said something against God. They'd done evil. And so then the Lord said, now you're going to stay here and here's your judgment. This is what's going to happen to you. And so then they're like, no, we're going to change our mind. We're going to go back. And they presumed. And they suffered loss because they presumed. This is very important to know as a principle. We have to know what God is saying in our hour, in our time, and we got to know what the word of God says on the matter. Because you can't just go walk on water when a river floods unless you hear God's word on the matter. See, they didn't ask God, those three girls. They presumed that's what God wanted to do. They didn't get the word on the matter. You can see by their shipwreck, which is so tragic. And, then, and a lot of people struggled with it. And, uh, and, uh, and so there had to be some teaching about it. And that's where this principle that when I first started learning about presumption, I remember going through that and learning, hey, listen, you got to have God's written word on number one. If it's not God's, there's no God, uh, God's written word on the matter. You can't walk in faith for it. You have to get another word from God, a rhema word from God. And so... Uh, We need to make sure that when we're going to operate in the prayer of faith, we have scripture. And that scripture has been worked into us. And so uh, the other thing I talked about um, last night, we're going to turn to 1 Timothy 4.2. And I talked about a seared conscience. See, if you're going to work in the prayer of faith, And you're working faith, even with the scriptures, you need to know what's working in you. So in first Timothy. Four, verse two. 
1 Timothy 4 to. It says, uh, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so, uh, what's interesting about this searing of the conscience, all right? Um, in order to have faith with a good conscience that we had talked about before, faith with a good conscience, a genuine type of faith, um, we need to make sure that our conscience isn't seared. A lot of times people get into presumption because their consciences are seared. And for instance, you cannot pray the prayer of faith for someone else's car. Because God didn't give you someone else's car. That belongs to him. That's like saying, hey, in the, uh, in the law it says don't covet someone else's stuff. Their donkey, their wife, and all these different things. Don't do that. But if you got a seared conscience, you can presume that you can take God's word and some of these principles and apply it to whatever situation you want. That's not how it works. A lot of times people don't realize that they are trying to pray something that's against God's will. Can't pray for someone else's wife or someone else's stuff. That belongs to them. But what you can pray for is God would bring you someone for you or he would bring you a vehicle. He provide all your needs according to his riches and glory. There's so many different scriptures. A man finds a wife, finds a good thing, obtains favor from the Lord. I remember praying, Lord, give me some favor. Lord, give me some favor. I want to be obtained some favor, God. The Lord gave me my wonderful wife, who has uh, definitely been a blessing and a help in my life. And so God gave me favor. So we can pray for stuff like that. We can pray finding God's promises in the written word. He provide all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, if you have a need for a vehicle, you have a need for clothes, you have a need for those different things, you can pray and ask God. But he didn't say, I'm going to give you someone else's stuff. That's against his word. It's against his word. So there's things. And the, another example is, Lord, I'm going to pray that you protect me. As I go out and rob this bank, I ask you that you would make me successful and that you would prosper me and bless me as I steal from people. No. No, no, no. You'll be like those Israelites who presumed and went out and they got destroyed. Because protection has been removed from you. Why? Because you presumed and you moved out of the covering and protection of God. And it will cost you shipwreck faith. God taught me because I inquired. I was like, Lord, what's going on here? So he began to go through in my life about presumption. And so if you have a seared conscience, it's very hard to tell where your level of faith is. Very hard to tell whether because there's times you're like, how did you put together this scripture and that one to pray to God for? I don't understand. And yet they had a seared conscience. A seared conscience. Make sure that you have a clean conscience and a good conscience before God before you can move in faith. Before you can pray the prayer of faith. I didn't know all these different things. I go and I try to pray the prayer of faith and I wasn't very effective. Seared conscience. At times and at times lack of love wasn't getting it to work because my love was just lacking. And then I had uh, the problem of not submitting my will to God beforehand. So these things, we've got to know how things work beforehand. Now, in the prayer of faith, if you're praying if, you're not praying the prayer of faith. And so uh, we got to, you know, I said before, we got to make sure that it is in um, the scripture. And so all this, all the, the requests that we make, we need a scripture, we need a verse so that we can stand on God's word. And we need to make sure that the context of it is correct. Not just, well, Peter did it, so I'm going to believe. Well, we've got to find where God promises it to us. Well, that's part and parcel of what we are trying to move into. And so... Um, 
we got to make sure that we have that scripture and verse. If we have the scripture and verse, uh, we need to make sure that this scripture and verse. Hey, can you bring that back a little bit? Because I'll be using that board in a little bit. Okay. Um, that, that, that verse um, is what will give us the faith that we need. And sometimes I remember coming across certain verses and I was just like, all right, I'm trying to believe there. And I was getting into me a little bit, but I wasn't quite mature enough in it yet. A lot of times we try to move out, but we're not confident. That's where that faith with a good conscience, it's like that parameter that tells us, hey, you're here or you're not here. You're at this level or you're not at this level yet. So if you're going to pray the prayer of faith for somebody and you get there and you're like, oh, God, I hope you move today. You might need to get back in your prayer closet and meditate in God's word before you can get out again. Uh, a lot of times I remember going to pray a prayer of faith with a group of people. And then at the end of it, someone asks, oh, what do you think God's going to move? What do you think is going to happen? I'm like, I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Didn't we pray the prayer of faith based on scripture? Got to know what God's going to do before you get there. Got to go God's word on the matter. And so uh, we're going to turn here because there's a place where the prayer of faith, you know, it's kind of epitomized and we, we look at it and most of us are familiar. We say, okay, let's go to scripture. It's going to be uh, Mark. Uh, there's actually two places that we'll find, but one of them is Mark 11, 23 and 24. And so we need to look and kind of break this down um, about praying the prayer of faith, in Mark 11. Uh, Mark 11. Now I'm going to see how the Lord leads us on this one today uh, because uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get all this in one uh, uh, sermon um, because there's some stuff we need to know when it comes to praying. And I'm going to let I'm going to show you here in just a second. But in verse 23, it says, uh, actually, verse 22, it says, so Jesus answered, said to them, have faith in God. We need to make sure we understand what that really is saying in the Greek, because sometimes our English translations are not portraying what the Greek is saying the most accurate. So it actually is that word in is of or from in the Greek. So it's to have faith of or from God. There's something coming from him to you first. And so what I believe is as you have prayed the prayer of dedication. As you have come before the Lord to love him. Love God means you love him by obeying his commandments. You obey his commandments. You know what he wants to do on the matter. You know what his commands are to do. You know his word. Um, That is going to put you in this place where faith is going to begin to flow from him to you. And you can't do anything in God's kingdom, or you're not supposed to, without God's love in the matter. Because faith is supposed to work by love. And uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So in order to have faith to please God, and faith works by love, you need love. You need love. So a lot of times, uh, I spend a lot of time trying to build my faith and not so much time trying to build love. And I found myself utterly disappointed until I started saying, all right, Lord, I want your love. And then I started growing in love and not so much. And and I wasn't necessarily what I called focusing on faith. But just having love will activate just a little faith. It's amazing how that love of God will begin to just move things, especially when it comes to our life. So we see that in this scripture, we're going to read verse 22, or 23 and 24. It says, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. I want you to keep that kind of up here. Doesn't doubt in his heart. But believes that those things he says will be done. He'll have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things on, uh, you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So what's important about this prayer of faith is we need to know tenses here. And uh, 
And we need to see that there is what I call this point A. Point B. And A is when we pray. B is when we see it in manifestation. We need to understand that there is a process between A and B. And so in this, we're going to look at three uh, different tenses that happens. Um, we're going to look at the first one is this present tense. And the present tense is when you pray. When you pray, present tense. Then we're going to uh, look at this past perfect tense. Put that on there, past perfect tense. Past perfect tense is believe you have received. I don't know if I'm going to get there. So. Okay, see if you can see that on there. Um, I'll say it out loud, so if you can't quite uh, see it on the board, we're still working on getting that, and I probably should get another marker here. Um, so just be patient with us as we're growing. Um, so we got that past perfect tense is believe you have received. All right. Then we look at this next tense, which is future. Future tense. This is uh, usually where uh, we all want to get to. Um, you will have them. You will have them. So we got the present tense when you pray. The number two, you got the past perfect tense, believe you have received. And the future tense is you will have them. Um, and so at point A, all right, right here, when you pray, okay, at this point, right here, these two go together. The past perfect tense needs to happen. Believe you have received. At this point, when you pray, you have to believe you receive it, according to what the scriptures say. So, for instance, if we're looking at healing, when you pray, believe you have received at point A. I believe that I'm healed. I believe by stripes I'm healed. I got, I got it. All right. Now, what's interesting about it is you have to carry this over. This uh, believe you have received has to be you're in your mindset and where you're at. All the way to you see this future tense come to play. You will have them. This is where you have them right here. You have to, at the point that you pray, point A, believe you receive them, then you'll have them. So you have to believe you have it first before you actually have it. Which sometimes... From a worldly wisdom doesn't make sense. A worldly wisdom. There's two types of wisdom, by the way. There's a worldly wisdom and there's a godly wisdom. All right. This doesn't make sense to a carnal mind. Well, what are you talking about? I'm still sick. Why am I going to believe that I have received healing when I'm still sick? Doesn't make any sense. Isn't that a lie? If I hear that, isn't that a lie? No, it's not, because you are exercising godly wisdom according to his word. Different than worldly wisdom. You want to know if you got a carnal mind, then this doesn't work for you. And that's just the truth. You will have them is a point later than when you believe you receive. This is in the prayer of faith. All right? Now... We got our tenses right. Got to get your tenses right. 
you get your tenses right, you'll stay where you need to be because this is important on this. These two scriptures says a lot. All right. <clears throat> so we have to maintain our faith level of believing we have received from point A to point B, which is you have uh, you will have to you have to maintain it. Maintaining is what I also will call right here the test faith. All right, the test of faith. That's another way to say maintaining um, what you're believing. It's a test of faith. And we all got to pass the test of faith. Because the enemy, he comes to steal the word. He wants to steal this from me. Because once you taste and see that the Lord is good, once you have get, once you get this, and you start exercising it, and you start getting breakthrough. And that seed of God's word begins to produce fruit in your life. You are going to see the kingdom of God. You're going to see the presence of God. You're going to see the promises of God come and manifest in your life. But there's always, always, always the test of faith. You don't get away from it. It will happen every single time. And this test of faith is where you have to maintain the level of belief. Believing you have received. Maintain the level. Now let me tell you. Um, there's so many times when I was what I call doing this. Going up and down and up and down and up and down. All right. I was like, okay, yeah, I believe God. I believe God because I, I go back to the scripture. I believe I received before I had it. I was believing I received it. And then it was like, oh, I don't know, God. I mean, I don't know. I'm not healed. Just go back and forth. What I call that is where I was keeping my eyes. See, I would, when I was up, I was keeping my eyes on the word. When I was down, I was keeping my eyes on my circumstance. Or how would we put it? Or physical, let's just put that. So we got the word of the spiritual, the unseen. So when I was up, I was keeping my mind on the word of God. What God said about the matter. When I got down... It's because I began to look at how I felt, what I was experiencing. It's times, just so you know, these are both real. They're both real. And I have to go over this. Um, I'm actually skipping ahead here, but uh, we don't deny that you have physical sickness. There's some colds and stuff that get off. Well, you're not sick. You don't have any sickness in your body. You're fine. You just believe that you're healed. Now, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, the sickness is there, right? The sickness is there. If you don't have fingers, you don't have fingers. If you're a leper, you do have leprosy. Those things are real. The, these two, uh, what I call realms, the physical and the spiritual, they're both real, but one's higher than the other. But what we do is when you ha we're not dis denying that that's there. What we do is we deny the right for it to exist because there's a higher law at work. It's like uh, the law of gravity, just as an example. The law of gravity um, will pull something down every single time. Throw up a rock, throw up whatever, it's going to fall to the ground. But there's a higher law, the law of lift. You start operating the law of lift, you can fly. And the law of gravity doesn't have the same working that uh, it did before. There's a higher law in the play. So we don't deny that there's a physical sickness because the gravity is real. The sickness is real. But what we do is we're able to tap into a higher law here. The law of the spirit of, that comes through the word. Where we're able to exercise faith. So... We have to be careful what we say in these times, all right? So uh, there's a place that we believe what the Word of God says on the matter. So you get to choose what you say, and you get to choose what you believe. You can believe anything you want. You can find all kinds of people, can say all kinds of things. There's no scientific evidence. But even if someone has scientific evidence, they still don't have to believe it. It's interesting. 
So interesting how for so long, no one had scientific evidence to prove that the world was flat, but people believed it anyways. Was it true? No, it wasn't true. But when we begin to believe in the truth, God's word on the matter, we're going to say something. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We've got to know what's inside of us. And so if you're not quite there believing yet, changing what you say is key. So what you believe, you say. So here's, here's where this comes into play. There's two realities, one's higher or not. Which law do you believe in? Do you believe in natural laws? Those are true. They're like, see, this is natural. This is there. I can show you that I have cancer. I can show you all the tests. All right. That's fine. That's, that's one realm right here. But then there's a higher realm of the word of God, the spiritual realm that God has given us these promises in. You can choose which one you get to say. Are you going to just remain and want to operate it where what I call gravity is at work? You're not going to fly. See, I can't fly. I can't get up there. See, gravity's pulling me down. Or, oh yeah, I fly. So I got the law lift. Both are true. You just get to choose which one you want to operate. The law of gravity or the law of lift. Same way with faith. You can say, I feel sick. I got cancer. I got this. I got that. Or you can say, by Jesus stripes, I was healed. You get to choose. Both are true. Which one do you want to win? Which one do you want to exercise? I had a problem with how do you describe these things? I think this is a great way to describe it. Which one do you want to put in operation because both exist? One is greater because those things that are seen come from the things that are unseen. Higher law. If you can learn how to work higher laws in your life that come from the word of God, you can begin to lift and fly in the situation instead of being drugged down by the gravity or the weight of the world, the cares of the world. Um, so we got to be careful what we say, but we get to choose. And we get to choose what we say in the matter. Um, so we got to be single-minded um, and keeping this perseverance going through this test of faith and uh, what God said on the matter. Unwavering. Now, <clears throat> while you're in this, uh, what I call the test of faith, and you're trying to keep your levels high, and I've talked about a lot of these different things, so I'm just going to run through a few of them real fast. Um, the first one is meditating on God's word, keeping your eyes on the word of God. Uh, and we read about in Proverbs um, where it talks about, my son, attend to my words, Proverbs 4. Incline thine ears to my saying, let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to those who find them in health to hold men's body. Keep your eyes on the word of God. Keep them in your mouth. Because as you begin to speak God's word, it will literally become life to your body. So if you need healing, that's the case. Um, and so we also see meditating on God's word in Joshua chapter one. It says, you know, keep the word of God in your, in your, in your mouth. Uh, meditate on it day and night. We also see in Proverbs one where it talks about meditate on the word day and night. So there's a key in meditating on God's word, looking at it, speaking God's word, keeping it in your heart. It will keep this level up. Believe in God. And then faith comes by hearing, hear by the word of God. So just meditate on it, hear it, because when you speak it, you're hearing it also, which is powerful. Love it. All right. The second one that you'll see in maintaining the faith level is you begin to visualize what God said about the matter. A lot of times people are oh, going to be careful with visualizing because that's new age. Uh, let me explain a little thing here. Everything that the enemy does is perverted from something he got from God. He's not original. He just perverts what belongs to God because he doesn't have the ability to create. He has the ability to pervert. He's not the creator. He's not the I am. He is a creation and he just likes to pervert what belongs to God. Visualizing is something that the Father God that we see in the Old Testament in Genesis, and we're not going to turn there, but Genesis 15, you'll find where um, – there is Abraham, and God's telling him, see those stars, Abraham? Those are like your children. See the sand? Those are like your children. He's beginning to get him to visualize the promise of a child. Because for so long, him and Sarah have been barren, and all they saw was a barren womb. 
That's all they saw. You have no children. You are barren, Abram. But then God, after he began to show him, hey, look at that. He began to get this picture in him. A lot of times people can't stay in faith because they can't see it. When you meditate on God's word, and you, it helps you to begin to see it. Get a new picture into you. So that's why the Lord told Abraham. And it wasn't Abraham at the time, it was Abram. He changed what he saw first before he changed what he said second. He called him a father of many nations, Abraham. That was, that was after the Lord for years and years said, look at those stars and look at that sand. Those are your children. Then he said, I'll call you Abraham, father of many nations. So then after he began to change the picture of what was in him, then he began to change what he said. That's for a reason and a purpose. And I'm going on kind of like a top level here because we can get all kinds into this. And uh, But he began to do what he said first is change the picture. Then after he changed the picture, he changed what he said. All right. So then the next thing uh, when it came to maintaining the faith level and going through this test of faith is thanksgiving and praise for the answer. I'd like to give 2 Corinthians 2.14. Uh, for that. But thanks be to God causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, always causes us to triumph. And we'll turn there just because uh, I want you to see this one specifically. I don't know how many times I had to go back to this scripture. It has revolution, uh, revolutionized my life because um, when you're in a place to where you got a seared conscience, you're in a place to where you're broken and you haven't seen things work. And uh, it seems like everything you do is not working. Second uh, Corinthians 2. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The thanksgiving comes before the triumph. See, if you want to know you're in faith, thanksgiving is the fruit of that. If you want to know if you're in doubt, complaining is the fruit of that. When I heard that, I was like, huh, that's really pretty good. Because people who don't believe God complain. Look at the children of Israel. They complained because they didn't believe that he could provide. Oh, Lord, this and that. Oh, we got, you know, give us a quail and all this. They complained all the time. They didn't believe him. It even tells us in Hebrews about they didn't believe. They didn't pass these tests. But you want to pass the test of faith. You want to know where you're at. And even though you might not feel it, but you're doing your best to go through that fire, that test of faith. Get that thanksgiving in your mouth. I thank you, Father. By your stripes, I was healed. I thank you. I thank you. You provided Jesus for me. I remember that changed my whole life around. I started going from not winning anything to start winning some. I'm like, oh, look at this. And what I love about it is at that time, I was dealing with a lot of depression. Uh, when you see everything just kind of spiral down, your life goes, boom, just explodes, and there's nothing left, really. And you're like, all I got left is Jesus and his word. And I just remember crying out to Jesus. And then, Lord, help me. Just help me. And I remember coming across this uh, powerful truth, and I began to apply it. I remember, I, I just remembered at one point in time, because it was a big process of years. And I remember when I first told the Lord, Father, I told him, I said, I'm not thankful for one thing. And I know I should be. I'm just not. I have no thankfulness in my life. And I told him I was real. And, uh, and I remember being like, Lord, help me. I want to be thankful, but I'm just not. At that time, I had a seared conscience. I had broken heart, all these different things. 
And the Lord took me through years of process to help me because I didn't know all these things at one time. I began to learn slowly by experience. And I remember the Lord took me through this process and I went to, uh, actually I went to the military and uh, ended up getting injured and coming out of it. Uh, and I remember when I was in the military, man, it was amazing how thankful I began to get. It's like, man, I had it so good. Uh, but I remember praying and sending all this time with God as I was going through this time of testing. And I remember getting thankful again. When I got thankful, what's amazing is this. Thankfulness will bring joy. It will. It will draw on joy. And I remember I started to enjoy life again. Thanks be to God. I remember I started getting thankful. And then guess what? I got attacked again at different points in my life, and it pulled me back down. And my mouth started being complaining, and I just went back through that cycle because I didn't know how to win yet. I learned a little bit. Okay, be thankful. Man, this is awesome. I'm thankful again. Then I went through the cycle again. Because you go around this test of faith until you start to get it really, uh, the trying of your faith works patience. It's more precious than gold. So as you get that test tried or that faith tried, you're going to start to experience different things. And sometimes you might go through this test a couple times, different areas. But I just remember, oh, I got to get back to Thanksgiving. But I didn't realize that's what God was trying to teach me until someone told me this scripture. Because I was just like, oh, well, no, I'll just you know, thank God. And then when I got this revelation, but thanks be to God, Thanksgiving victory. Um, I found it to be life changing. And then I realized, huh, when I was thankful, I was victorious. I had joy. My life was good. When I wasn't thankful, well, everything just started spiraling down to nothing. Started losing. Got that Eeyore cloud that followed me around. And every time I went somewhere, everyone scattered like, oh, man, he's back. All right. We don't want that for anybody because it's horrible. Um, but God is so good. Because you'll put people in your life to help you out, even though you don't necessarily uh, do it right. But thank God that we have the love of God in our hearts. Um, but I want to turn just to reiterate, uh, or just to reinforce this point to Romans 4.17. In Romans 4.17, we see that the Lord tells us to do some stuff. We see that there's some keys here. And this in Romans 4, um, it's talking about Abraham which we talked about in Genesis, about visualizing. But this, this next point here is I told you that he began to see something first. Then the Lord changed his name, and then he began to say something, which we see this in uh, Romans 4, 17. And it says, uh, as I've written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who whom he believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Call those things that be not as though they were, the things that don't exist as though they do exist. That's where we get into this here, this physical and spiritual realm. See, it doesn't exist in the physical yet. In the spiritual, it's truth. It's there. It's you know, Those things that are physical come from the things that are spiritual, the invisible. And so he began to call those things that be uh, be not as though they were, or those things that did not exist as though they existed. That's what he's doing here. He's beginning to speak it out, calling it out. Call those things that be not as though they were. For example, by his stripes I was healed. By his stripes I am healed. Yet, I still got some stuff that I got to grow in or I'm trying to you know, get it out of my body, no matter what it is. I call those things that be not as though they were. You can't do that yet if you have doubt in your heart. See, when we read about in Mark 11 and does not doubt in the heart, because Mark 11, we're going to turn back to there, to Mark 11, 23 specifically. Um, it says, and not doubt, does not doubt in his heart. See, a lot of times people say the right thing because we've been trained in a lot of ways 
They say the right thing, but they don't believe it. A lot of times you go to church. Hey, how's it going, brother or sister? Oh, I'm blessed. Oh, God is good. Praise God. Woo! And then uh, after service, they go home and they cry and break down. Oh, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through the situation. I don't know, Lord. I mean, I need some help, God. I And everybody else is saying the right thing, but they get home, it's completely different. See, we need to make what we say consistent with what we believe. There is a powerful truth about being real. You might say, hey, listen, I'm standing. No, I'm, I'm doing the best I know. Because you had the publican and the Pharisee, and the publican said... God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He was being real. Pharisees like, hey, I fast twice a week. I'm doing good, blah, blah, blah. You know, and he said, which one did God hear? There is a truth and a power about being truthful and real where you're at. Instead of saying, oh, God, yeah, I believe. Thank God, praise God. And you get home and like, I don't believe. Lord, you're speaking different. If you will just determine inside yourself to make sure that you have consistent truth in what you say, no matter if it's indoors or out of doors, there will be power that starts to enter your words. Because your tongue won't be producing evil or good. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. you got to keep your heart in one place. And so when I was going through this, I began to learn, I'd rather not say anything at all than say the wrong thing. Someone asks me how I'm doing, I'll just be like, I'm blessed. But when I got home, I wasn't going to change it based on how I felt felt or what I seen at the, the circumstance. Because there's some circumstances I was like, God, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how it's going to work out. But I choose to believe that no matter what, you're faithful. You are faithful. I kept the same words, the same confession, and the same belief. And I told the Lord at times, I believe there's a place that the only person that you can talk to God about things that you're struggling with, uh, the only person you can talk to is God about the things you're struggling with. Sorry about that. There's times I'm like, Lord, I'm struggling with this because I'm feeling, I feel like stuff's not working. I'm going through this test of faith, Father. Please help me be real. Just like that publican was. He was real with God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I got nothing else. And that time I told Lord, I'm doing everything I know to believe, but I just, I'm not there. I don't know what's going on with me. It seems like my conscience is letting me know I just don't, I don't have it. I need it. I need you to help me. I'm going through this test of faith. I held on to his word. I let him know I was being real with him. But I wasn't speaking to other people about it, and I wasn't changing what I was going to say. I said, I know what you said, God. I have gone through this scripture. I know what you said. I'm not letting go. And so there's this no doubt in the heart. So we turn back to uh, Mark 11, 23, 24. It says, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain. See, this is the process of saying be removed and cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart. I want to talk about this not doubting in the heart. So we have this here. I'm going to leave with the top portion um, about the test of faith in A to B. But I want us to look at, um, I feel led to do this. I want us to look at the heart. Now, there's a lot of teaching on this, so I'm just going to go through this place where I'm going to make it a little bit concise. But um, the heart, as we found, we have. Let me get another market here. See what we, got here. we have a spirit. I'm going to change this up. Sorry about that. We have a spirit, and we have a soul. We live in a body. Uh, usually we represent this with like three different circles. Okay. 
And as we studied in the scripture, we found out the heart is made up of all the spirit and all the soul. Okay? All the spirit and all the soul. It says in Mark 11, 23, and does not doubt in his heart. So what I would like to say here is there needs to be agreement between the spirit and the soul. Now, what I mean by agreement is this. The things of the spirit need to come into the things of the soul. Now, uh, we know that in our body, sorry, in our body dwells, uh, you know, the law of sin and death, you know, the, the sin nature. And the body's trying to influence the soul and the spirit's trying to influence the soul. Because when you're born again, you have a born again spirit, which has a renewed desire, a renewed will and a renewed mind. Now, what I want to put on and put in here, there's our, our let me put this here, there's the desires are what we sometimes have referred to in the past as emotions. And we have the will. And the third one, we have the mind. The reason why I put them in one, two, and three is we know who wins out of the emotions, will, and the mind. Anybody know? The emotions do. The desires win. As you look at Solomon, the wisest man on the face of earth at the time, and he knew better. He knew. But yet his desires and his emotions began to pull him away from God. The Lord said, hey, in his word, don't marry a whole bunch of women and don't marry foreign women that serve foreign gods because they'll draw your heart away from me. Well, he knew that. And at one time he was serving God. But then these emotions and these desires began to creep up and pull them away from God. So we know that, um, I'm just giving some subject, that our spirit has desires and emotions, a will and a mind. The spirit does. All right. Our soul has the exact same thing. Desires, emotions, will and a mind, and so does the body. I'm trying to sum this up a little bit. Um, so the spirit and the soul consist of the heart. You're supposed to have no doubt In his heart. That means no doubt in your spirit and soul, which means there has to be no doubt in your desires or your emotions, your will and your mind. This is easy to say, a little bit more difficult to do. Where your desires or your emotions don't have any doubt in them. Your will doesn't have any doubt. And your mind doesn't have any doubt. And what I'm going to talk about a few things. We're not going to go into too much detail, but I'm going to give us some, uh, some scriptures to help us with these things. Um, so I want to give us the start, what I call the master key. The master key. All right. See, we know that our spirit's been renewed, so that's all in right. Right? It's the soul that needs to be uh, transformed. Okay. The first thing that you need, what I call the master key to all these, is love. Love. And I write down 1 Corinthians 13. All right? Love will help every single one of these. Do you love God? You'll get your will in order. Because you don't mind dying daily to your will, picking up your cross and following after him. That's really how you win, is love for God. This love will change your will to come into alignment with the will that's in the spirit, your spirit, that's coming from God. Your mind um, also will be influenced by the love of God. Um, and so the first thing that we're going to talk about uh, is God's love here. But I want to talk about these desires or this emotion because it seems to be the most powerful one that we deal with. Because it was the most powerful one I dealt with. All right. So let's give an example. Do you feel healed? No, I don't. 
my emotions and everything in me is racing. I'm kind of angry because I'm not feeling God's power working. And most of the time, I will to walk into God's word, but this emotions would pull me up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. All right. And so when I realized that these desires and these emotions um, that I was dealing with, the key was love to that. And I'm going to explain why that's the key. Um, Let's turn to Galatians 5, chapter 20, or Galatians 5, verse 22 through 25. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. um, I'm sorry, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. What's interesting about this, it says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. But right before that, it gives you these fruits of the spirit. Now, the crucifixion of the passions and desires or the crucified flesh. That Jesus talked about, pick up your cross and follow after me. It starts in the will first. All right. This will decides I'm going to obey God. I'm going to obey the Lord. And uh, as a quick, we're not going to turn there right now, but Mark 834 talks about that. Um, Well, we'll turn there. Hold your place in Galatians if you can. Mark 8.34. Mark 8.34 says, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. And so what's interesting about there, you see these word desire. There's a desire here. Desire to follow after Christ. Now the desires and the will, they kind of work together. There's a working of them. And so we have to... Desire to come after God, but desire to, we have to deny ourselves, come after Jesus, all right, and pick up that cross, follow him. So there's this place where we will first to desire. We will to desire. And in this willing to desire, when you will to follow after him, These desires that we had, because there's two kinds of desires that we see at play. The desires of the flesh or the carnal man, the desires of the spiritual man. All right. We see that in in an unrenewed soul that the spirit desires are in the body. The body's desires and the spirit's desires, they're, they're conflicting against one another. All right. But what happens is the desires of the spirit, as it begins to grow, and as you begin to get in alignment with God, will come to the place where it dominates the desires of the soul and dominates the desires of the body. Same thing for the will, same thing for the mind. But we have to start by crucifying our flesh first and coming after him. Well, these desires and these emotions that we're dealing with in Galatians we see that these are emotions that we deal with. All right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. All right? Now, these fruits will come into your emotions. Now, most of the time, um, if you look up into, uh, I'll just read verse 20 in Galatians 5. It says, uh, or verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, 
idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfless ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. For which I tell you before, and just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then you have the fruits of the Spirit. Um, I like to use uh, outburst of wrath for my example. All right. So many times I get outbursts where I was angry. All right. That anger dominated my emotions. But I didn't realize that my emotions are subject to the things of God. Because there's a desire of the spirit. There's fruits of the spirit. Now, outbursts of wrath, if you have the working of the emotion of God's love, the desire of God, into your emotions or your soul, you'll find that God's love is patient. All right? 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians uh, 5.22 correspond with one another. 5.22 and 23. They correspond with one another. And I've taught on that before. But the reason why they correspond with one another is as you're growing in love, the emotional part of us and these desires will correspond. It's like, oh, I'm growing in love. This outburst of wrath are falling off of me. I'm not angry. The love starts to grow because these are all uh, fruits of love, by the way. Um, and so then the joy begins to come up. The peace begins to come because, you know, a lot of times I, I, I would be anxious or I'd have this worry and these things. and um, But then when I got that love started working, that joy started working, then all of a sudden the peace started working. It's like, oh, man, can't buy this. Can't buy this. Long suffering began to come because, I mean, let me tell you, that's not a normal emotion. Most people are not willing to be long suffering. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm done with this. <laughs> See ya. And that's how I was. I'll cut my losses and I'll move on. This is costing too much. But then long suffering started coming. And then it's very difficult to be kind in the midst of someone being, you know, a jerk to you, cutting you off. You ever wonder how someone slaps you in the face and you're supposed to turn the other cheek? You ever wonder that? I was like, from this perspective, I was like, no, we're not having that. Lord, if someone slaps me in the cheek, I don't know if I can turn the other one. Maybe a, a left or a right and then a body slam, but uh, turning the other one, uh-uh. But when you begin to be dominated in your desires with the emotions of God, the love of God begins to dominate into this desires because you had a will choice. And God will help your will also. Love will help your will. Love will help your desires or your emotions. Love will help your mind. That's the master key. And then we find there's like flows of it that comes because sometimes our mind doesn't have peace. That's where the fruits of the Spirit come in, which are fruits of love. Peace will come into there. Uh, your will, you will to be long suffering, which is a fruit of love. Part of love. So that's why I like to start out with the master key and then we kind of focus in on different scriptures that help deal with these things and some of the workings. Um, so we see that our desires or our emotions um, can be dealt with with the fruits of love through Galatians 5. Um, and then uh, our will is dealt with with Mark 8 34, which is you choose to crucify that flesh and take up your cross and follow after him. And then uh, uh, we're going to look at another one of the desires real quick. It's 1 Timothy. Go back to the book of Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, 19. And this is where we have having faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the, uh, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. So this faith with a good conscience affects our desires and our emotions. Now, the reason why it affects our desires or our emotions is because there's a place where your conscience lets you know. Check mark. 
Not there yet. You might need to. <laughs> There's been times when I get in a situation and I'm not feeling the love of God flow. I'm actually feeling like I'm about to lose and my conscience lets me know. You don't have it yet. So I go back and I get in the word and I begin to meditate on God's word. I've been spending this time in his word and, and praying and, and thanking God until I get that level built up again. Um, there's a way I pray in the spirit at different times. But these things will fluctuate. Now, there's a couple times when I've learned that you can bring these into subjection by speaking to them. You get to tell them what to do. Because it says bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I told him, uh uh-uh, emotions, nope, we're not doing this. I'm not going to feel that way. That's not, that's contrary to God's word. A lot of times people don't realize that their emotions are subject to the word of God. A lot of times I hear, well, I don't feel that way. Well, this is real to me and this is how I feel. I'm like, well, according to God's word, you shouldn't feel that way about the matter. Your feelings are wrong. Contrary to the word, you need to bring those into subjection because those emo- those emotions will come from a thought most of the time. Like, how can you tell somebody who comes into a room and says, well, they just don't like me. They rejected me. See, they're not coming and talking to me. And I've seen I've, I've watched it. Like, there's nobody in that room who treated you well. That's a spiritual thing. Someone is telling you that they rejected you or they don't like you. You cast that down to the obedience of Christ. And even if they don't like you, well, you love them anyways. So there's those different things that we're able to put into subjection by speaking God's word and standing in faith. Um, and so then the, the last one I want to talk about here about getting this no doubt in the heart is renewing the mind. And uh, Romans 12, 2, I want to turn to that. Romans 12, 2. Uh, Actually, I'll, I'll read verse 1 because you'll see how all these start off with Coming to the Lord and laying stuff down. Romans chapter 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So we see that we have to uh, bring our, our will into subjection, bring our desires into subjection. And now we see that this precedes this next part, which is your mind. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may approve what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Praise the Lord. There's a process of renewal of the mind, a transformation process that has to happen here before you can get to the place of no doubt. Now, what I like about all this is if you begin to get into the love of God, By loving him through getting into his word, you're meditating on it day and night. It begins to deal with all of these at the same time. The word begins to deal with all of them. The laying down your life, the walking in love, they'll deal with every single one of these. Because if you get in the word because you love God, you will deal with the love thing deals with this will. Okay, Lord, I lay my life down. But by loving God, by obeying his word... You find out that you begin to renew that mind. The mind is getting renewed. Then all of a sudden, as you're getting more into that word because you're loving God, you begin to grow in love. Which deals with the desires and the emotions. Love is the master key. We're going to turn to Ephesians 5.26 because I want to see I want you to see another thing about uh, the word of God, and we've gone over this at different times. Um, five Ephesians five twenty six, and it's talking about Christ. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. So there is a washing of the water by the word that needs to happen. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're washing all these things out. Getting them cleansed. Every single one. Desire gets cleansed by the word. 
The will gets cleansed by the word. The mind gets cleansed by the word. Because if you get in the word long enough, it's amazing how your desires will begin to change. I remember um, I was struggling with desiring things I shouldn't. I had a seared conscience. And I talked about you got a seared conscience. It's kind of like when the first time you start lying. Oh, man, when I was younger, I started lying. And, man, I was, like, bothered by it. And then, uh, But you keep on doing it long enough. It's not a problem. You get a seared conscience. But then all of a sudden, later on in life, you get the renewing power of God. You get a new heart given to you. A heart that's filled with God's love. And he goes and he starts renewing all these things through his word. And what you notice is feeling starts coming back. That feeling of God and feeling of, oh, shouldn't do that. Or feel that you'll be able to feel stuff that you never felt for a long time because it was seared. But I remember there was a specific thing I was dealing with, and I'd done it for so long, but then I desired it. See, there was this searing that happened, but because it was seared, I had this wrong desire. And I'm like, God, please help me. As I began to get in the word. I began to meditate on it, speak it out, get it into me. That desire changed to where it became what I call uh, disgusting to me. Just like it was disgusting to God. Interesting how the word will begin to just work. And as you begin to pray, it also has an effect on all these things. And as you begin to worship and get thanksgiving, it has effect on all these things. But I like to start us off with the word of God by love. Because love is the master key. And if you love God, he says, if you love me, in John 14, 21, you'll obey my commandments and I'll love you. Obeying his commandments requires us to get into them. Requires us to meditate on them. And so we just set up how we're going to start walking out praying the prayer of faith. And uh, I'm just skimming all these little things. Getting the doubt out is a process of making sure all these are in line with God's love in them and God's word in them. So we're going to go to the next phase of actually praying the prayer of faith. Let's see where we're at right now. Huh. I might just uh, share a few points here because we got a lot more to cover. Uh, we got a lot more to cover on this. It's important that we find out all the stuff beforehand besides trying to do it and then realize it's not working. Getting rid of the doubt in our hearts is a process. It's a process. Going through the test of faith is a process. It doesn't just happen overnight. There's a growth period of time. But if you will do what it says and you won't let go, you'll have what God says you can have. The future tense will come and you will have it. It will. It will come. Um, let's see what time it is. I don't think. Oh, Lord, what do you want to do tonight? Yeah, I feel like the Lord's okay with it. Uh, there's a few points I might review next time, but I want us to go ahead and turn now to James 1. Actually, I'm sorry, James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And then we're going to go down to uh, <clears throat> verse 13. And specifically, we're going to look at verse 15. But I want to read verse 13. It says, is any among, anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call on the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Praise God. And then it says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed, that the effect of fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. And it goes down. We see here the prayer of faith. Anyone among you sick, let them call on the elders of the church. And so we're going to go through these here. James chapter 5, we see first that as any one of us is sick, what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to call on the elders. Number one. We're going to call on the elders. There's something on our part here. All right. Call on the elders, according to James 5. And what are the elders supposed to do? All right. This is a uh, we got to go through this because when I was going through these different things, I wanted to make sure I got it right. All right. So they call on the elders church. So let them pray over him. So the next thing the elders are going to do, they're going to pray over. Him. All right, this is really key word here, or a key phrase. Pray over. Then say they're going to beg God. Let the elders come and beg God and plead with God all night long. Oh Lord, He was He's a good He's a good person in the church. He's a good person in the church. Please come. Please come. That's not what he's saying. He said, pray over him, which is they are releasing something over them. All right? Praying over them. All right, that's the second one. And then we see um, anointing him with oil. All right. Anointing with oil. Now, a lot of times that's all we know to do is anoint with oil. All right. But there's a key here that a lot of us miss. It's really key. They're supposed to anoint with oil in what name? In Jesus' name. A lot of times they don't even know there's a name they're supposed to be going in. Anointing with oil in the name. In the name of the Lord, which is Jesus, by the way. It's that name. Jesus' name. All right. Anointing with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith. Shall save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. All right. So they're referencing these things that these elders are doing and this process as the prayer of faith. All right. They do this, it's considered the prayer of faith. And what will the prayer of faith do? Well, I guess it wasn't God's will to heal them. We prayed the prayer of faith and they died. Not what the Bible says. If you pray the prayer of faith, what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to get healed. They're going to raise up off that sick bed. Because it says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Not only is he going to raise them up, he's going to forgive their sins. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? I love this because number one says calls on the elders, right? Now, what this is given as an inference here that I believe is, for example, if someone is being judged, a lot of times they're like, well, you know, um, I'm, I'm enduring this sickness for God, you know, glorifying him, you know, or all they're under judgment or whatever it may be. Well, calling on the elders of the church is a place of submission. It's humbling. Come. Oh. Um, and it's a place that you're calling on them. 
I believe it's an inference of getting right with the authority structure in your life. See, there's an authority that God has placed in our life that is supposed to give things to us and God has ordained to help us. All right. Now, elders can be a pastor. It can be deacon. It can be all these different things that God has set in. Uh, but you're in proper placement with your authority. It's interesting. There's a covering there when you're in proper place with your authority because Jesus set the elders up. Jesus did. So you get in the right place at first. Call on the elders of church. Let them pray over you. Man underneath authority. Woman underneath authority of God. And then the elders are coming. What are they going to do? Pray over you. Not beg God to heal you. Pray over is a command form. They pray the prayer of faith. We're going to see some of this uh, stuff in a little bit more detail. Um, There's something that has to be done and exercised. Sickness, go in Jesus' name. See, Jesus didn't beg demons to leave. He didn't beg the Father to get the demons out, nor did he beg the Father to get the sickness out. He commanded it to go. He prayed over people. All right. Then they did something else. Now, this is interesting. Anointed with oil in the name of the Lord, which is Jesus. See, this anointing with oil is really pretty interesting because I believe what this is talking about is the laying on of hands. See, in the prayer of faith, they anoint him with oil. There's a laying on of hands going. See, I got my oil. All right, I'll just give an example here. You can't put oil on with the feet. No, you put it on with the hands. You got your hands involved, the elders' hands. So they anoint them with the, the oil, but not just, hey, I'm going to just put some oil on you. No, no, it's in something, it's in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. Now, what we're going to find here are some interesting things. Because this one here, these two here, uh, praying over him and the elders are, are consistent through Scripture. Let's turn to Mark 16. Now, I heard a lot of times that, uh, you know, I don't know too many theological things at this point in time, but when I heard some people don't believe that Mark 16 is in the Bible, I was like, what? Like, yeah, that's the only place you see this stuff, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. I'm like, oh, okay. But I believe uh, the reason why I'm saying that is because we're going to see a consistency of Scripture from James chapter 5 to Mark 16. And we're going to specifically look at 15 through 18. All right. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You're preaching. You're declaring something. All right. So. uh, I didn't realize I'm not going to have that much room. So I want you to put these as two conditions. The first one that they're doing is they're preaching the gospel. Right. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. Preaching the gospel of God. All right. Then it says. uh, He who believes and is baptized will be saved and he who does not believe will be condemned. All right. So we see there's another place to where if you believe and are baptized. So the first one is you're preaching the gospel and those people who believe and are baptized. All right. Which we've all had the gospel preached to us. We believed and we were baptized. Praise God. Then verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe, right? Who believe, not who doubt, who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. Here's the important part, in my name. What were they doing? Anointing people with oil in whose name? Jesus, in his name. It's important. You're going to pray the prayer of faith. You're going to pray over somebody. We need to do it in his name. In the name of Jesus. But it says, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. 
They'll cast out demons. Did they say that they pray and beg God to do it? No, they said they'll cast them out. Praise the Lord. Okay, now I want you to look at here. Um, this is not a period. This is a continuous statement in mine. It's a semicolon. Okay, so this is saying, in my name, they'll cast out demons. Now they can also put it like this. In my name, they will speak with new tongues. All right? In my name, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, you will by no means hurt them. So we'll see, in the name of Jesus, we can cast, we cast out demons, speak in new tongues, and um, we have protection against snakes and serpents, okay? There's protection there from God as you're going and you, you believe in our baptized and you preach the gospel. Then number four, which we're going to concentrate on, this next one, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. All right, we see elders here. In James chapter 5, doing what every believer can do, because these are given to all believers in Mark 16. The principles are the same for the elder as they are for the believer. You have to believe, and you're praying over. See, you're casting out demons. You're commanding sickness to go in the name of Jesus. But it says they lay hands on the sick. Well, what is the elder doing? He's anointing with oil. He's laying hands on the sick. What I love about this is we see there's a correlation between anointing and laying hands. James 5, they anointed him with oil after they prayed the prayer of faith, which is the giving the command. They said something. See, they preached the gospel in Mark 16. And they went out and in the name of Jesus, they began to cast out devils. They began to speak and give commands for things to be obeyed. They weren't just begging God to do something. Lord, if you heal this guy, he's done such a good work. It's not how we do things. We command things to happen according to the word of the Lord in the name of Jesus. All right? In the name of Jesus. Now, um, <clears throat> this is where it gets kind of uh, what I call the hard part in the prayer of faith. Because I heard, you know, you pray the prayer of faith more than once. Or say, you know, take seven times and, you know, the seventh time was the one in faith and six times before were in unbelief. Um, I like to put in another take on that. All right. I believe there's a misunderstanding of praying the prayer of faith and commanding. But I also believe there's a misunderstanding in application. All right. So we're going to look at this. I'm not going to go too much into the. You know, if you pray for someone more than once, because I pray for people more than one time and maybe there was unbelief. But I see Jesus doing things like praying for people more than one time. And he never did it in unbelief. But there's a working that has to happen. Now, I believe we command and we believe it's done. But then how we operate in the process is a little bit different. We're going to turn to uh, Mark 8. 20 through, 22 through 25. We're going to look at a specific case. Um, <clears throat> because as I was praying and getting ready, I believe the Lord gave a principle that I was like, ah, finally seen this because I was like, well, if you pray the prayer of faith one time, that's all you're supposed to need. Okay. But then I had this question. Well, I remember Jesus praying for someone more than once, all right? Then I begin to get into a little bit. I begin to notice something, and we're going to, I want you to, to keep in your mind this anointing with oil or laying on the hands that we see in Mark 16, all right? And it says in verse 22, then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. All right. Was he was he completed yet? No. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, um, you just go and believe. Keep on going. That's not what he did. This is another interesting point that Jesus did. Um, then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. 
This is what's interesting. He laid hands on him again. He anointed him again. See, when go pray the prayer of faith, we believe God. But what Jesus was doing was giving an application of the power and life of God out of himself. Remember that lady who touched him by faith? Well, he was touching that man by faith. You get this oil here. It's like, all right, he spit, he spit. This is one of those ones where you're like, oh, I hope someone doesn't have the anointing of spitting tonight, you know. Uh, but, hey, if God leads that way, and that's how we, we will flow with them. But we see that he uh, took that blind man by the time he led him out of the town, um, and he spit on his eyes. All right? And so he, he, uh, he was being led here. And then you see that he put his hands Sound familiar to James chapter 5, Mark 16, the hands. But he wasn't finished. He wasn't finished. You didn't see Jesus be like, oh man, I don't know. What he did again, he says, okay, I'm going to touch you again. I'm going to let that life of God flow out of me again. Because we already spoke the word. It was done. But we're gonna we're gonna lay our hands on you again. All right, now this is how we're gonna do it. Now I don't believe giving a command of what God wants to do in the situation is wrong. You can be like, all right, in the name of Jesus, release more lives. But you can still do it in the prayer of faith. So that so it's not oh, okay, you did it in doubt. No, Jesus Himself laid His hands on someone more than one time. All right. So I wanted to bring this up as we're praying the prayer of faith. Because you might go into a place, someone's on a sickbed. You pray the prayer of faith over them because they call on you. might be an elder. You might be someone who believes God. You go over them, you pray over them in the name of Jesus and command that sickness to go. You cast out a devil and you command the sickness to leave. You anoint him with oil in the name of Jesus, in his name. And then you might not see the fullness yet. Well, what do you see? Well, I see men like trees. Okay, you're not finished. We're going to put more life and I'm going to touch you again with the anointing of God. I didn't realize that there was a difference between the application and the speaking sometimes. See, you pray over him. That's only supposed to be one time. Doesn't mean that you can't go back and touch him again. Because you lay hands on the sick and what's going to happen? They'll recover. And according to James 5, you anoint them with oil. What was Jesus doing? He was releasing life into people. Wait a minute, you don't have enough yet? Okay, here's more. We're going to turn because I want to see that I want you to see this principle of this life. In Romans 8.11. Romans 8.11. It says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Does the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you? Yes, it does. You belong to him, right? He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. His life will start coming out of you. As you begin to release it in this anointing, as you pray the prayer of faith over people, there is a powerful principle of releasing the life of God through laying on of hands. You speak the word and then you just continue to give the life. Well, that was uh, been a good journey. I want to pray. Um, but before we pray, I want to give this uh, exhortation. Before you pray the prayer of faith, you have to pray the prayer of consecration, which is what's God's will in the matter. Next. You need to have love. 
You need to have love working and operating in your life. The love of God. Because faith works by love. When you pray the prayer of faith, you need to love somebody. Love God. Uh, I'm not going to turn there, but uh, Luke 5, 12. You see a leper come to Jesus. He said, if you're willing, you can heal me. And he, he, he laid down and implored that he was, you know, come before the Lord. And what I love about Jesus is he loved that man. Because at that time, that was an incurable disease. You're not going to see a Pharisee or Sadducee say, oh, let me touch you. No, but Jesus loved the man, I believe, and he went down into his level and he touched him. I'm willing to be clean. And immediately he was cleansed. What did he do with his hand? Luke chapter 5, verse 12, that story. Jesus touched the man. He touched him. He released something from his words, but he touched that man. We're going to need to, by faith, with the power of God, touch people. If you don't have the love of God flowing from your life, when you touch people, it's not going to be very effective. The love of God needs to flow. But when we stand and we pray the prayer of faith, Pray over people with the love of God, in the will of God, as we go out and do what he says, we're going to see things begin to work, just like Jesus said. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. It says, they lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. The Lord going with them, confirming his word with the signs that follow. Praise God. All righty. We're going to do close in prayer. Well, Father, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for helping us get the stops out, showing us how to get the doubt out, walk in love, and exercise the prayer of faith with the precious promises that you have given us. Father, I'm asking you that you would touch everyone here, everyone who watches online, God. Let them know the power that you've given them as a believer. Or if they're called and anointed as an elder, or God, as a fivefold, also that they have power in their hands. But if they're a believer, God, they have power in their hands to touch the sick in your name. I thank you, Father, that you are revealing truth. That you are doing signs, wonders, and miracles in this time and this hour. You're teaching us. And the word of God grows mightily and it prevails. I thank you, Father, so much for this word. And as we get tonight to come before you and pray, to humble ourselves and pray that prayer dedication as we get ready to exercise the prayer of faith, Father, I'm asking you that each one of us would have an encounter with you. We would not leave this place cha- or the same. We would leave this place changed forever by your touch and your glory. Father, let your glory come. Let your healing power come. Touch us, Father, that we would never be the same. Let your love come into us and flow out of us. Oh, my Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll do some Q and A. If you have any Q and A, yeah, we'll let it. We'll let it keep flowing. Um, I gave a lot out there. Uh, let's do the process. Um, Thank you.